Happy Friday, everyone. I'm your host, Brady Volp, founder of the Volp Firm and chief product officer of Open Vault. Our topic today is signal leakage field strength, part of our Back to Basics series with the industry legend, Ron Rannick. Why do we care about signal leakage field strength or even about signal leakage at all? Well, if you spent any time in the cable industry, you may have dealt with something called ingress and its counterpart, egress. You likely have also worked with equipment to identify signal leakage. Ron's going to help us understand what it means when we see numbers like 1,000 microvolts per meter. What does it mean? How is it calculated? Is a higher number worse than a lower number? Oh, so much to cover and so little time, but thankfully, we have a Ron. Speaking of Ron, let's introduce him. For our first time viewers, Ron is a 50 year veteran in the cable industry with more awards and accolades than I have fingers. His contributions to our industry are countless and he continues to be a vibrant asset to our industry. I'm very thrilled that he's willing to take some time out of his day and join us here and talk about signal leakage field strength. Hi Ron, thanks so much for joining in. Hey Brady, thanks for the kind words in the introduction and uh, a pleasant good day to all those who are tuning in for um, this presentation on signal leakage field strength. Uh, I will caution you, it does have some math in it. It's really kind of difficult to do to do justice to the topic of field strength without um, a, a little bit of number crunching in it. But I promise to try and make it not too painful and also um, illustrate an example um, with some graphics that will help to uh, maybe... Uh, Add the or aid the understanding of what this um, this whole leakage field strength is all about. So let me push the the uh, screen share button. Click this. Click that. We'll press get into that. it. And we appreciate and it. It's not going to be too painful, Ron. <laughs> well, yeah. I, whoops, I didn't want that one. I want get that, that slide up. There we. Go. Yeah, we see it good. Yep. All right. And uh, for those of you who've been in the industry a while, you may recognize. The guy in the picture there, that's Dick Shimp, who is now retired, but he, he worked for Comsonics for many, 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 many years. Yes. Uh, he's actually making signal leakage measurements. We were at a, at a customer site quite a few years ago, troubleshooting uh, some issues and characterizing signal leakage across different frequencies. And it was a fun project, but that's uh, that's Dick Shimp in that picture. So uh, a real thing going on. So let's um, start by answering the question, what is field strength? The, um, I think the industry has, has been dealing with this for a long, long time. I first got involved with signal leakage measurements back in the 1970s. I had no idea what field strength was, but it's something that we do, we, we measure, um, and quite frankly, we take it for granted. Um, well, we talked about it before because, I mean, there's a lot of confusion with it. We, we talk about CLI, we talk about leakage, ingress, egress. A lot of this is kind of confusing to us. Oh, yeah. This... This is a bit more complicated subject than it first appears. Measuring field strength is, I think, probably a lot easier than trying to understand what it is. And explain it. <laughs> well, yeah, and I'm going to attempt the explain it part here today. Um, but the typical way we measure field strength is, is to take a dedicated signal leakage detector that has, uh, has a, a resonant half-wave dipole or equivalent, um, some use external antennas or can use external antennas, but we use a dipolar equivalent. We orient the detector and its antenna to get the maximum reading and see what value the instrument reports. And there we are. And uh, the measured value of that thing called field strength is typically stated in microvolts per meter, which is abbreviated mu. That's what that little U-like symbol is. V slash M. We do not measure field strength in microvolts. We measure it in microvolts per meter. And that's a, an important differentiation to keep in mind. Um, and then we, of course, hope that the, the value we measure is below the FCC's signal leakage limits. Or if your company has even tighter leakage limits than what the FCC rules say, hopefully you um, comply with your own company's specifications. And um, you'll note I've got a little footnote at the bottom there that says that once you get outside the North American cable industry, field strength is typically measured in a different unit than microvolts per meter, although it's fairly easy to, to uh, translate between the two with a mathematical formula. And that's called decibel microvolt per meter, or dB mu V, 
slash m. I'm not going to talk about that any more than just mentioning that that it is used elsewhere. Uh, we're, we're focusing here on microvolts per meter in this presentation and what we do in the cable industry. Just a real quick question on that, uh, Ron. You mentioned the FCC and, and measuring these signals. The question comes up a lot. Do we need to still measure uh, the amount of signals that's being radiated out of our cable plants now that we've gone to where a lot of cable operators have gotten away from the analog, um, S, the, the legacy analog um, signals and moved to, they're still analog, but we call them SC -quam, or the SC QAM signals? Well, the answer is yes. Um, quite simply, Part 76 of the FCC rules was updated a few years ago to include new leakage field strength limits for both analog TV channels and digital signals. And if you look in 70, 70, part 76.605, there's a table in there that shows um, leakage field strength limits over, over different frequency ranges, and it shows it for analog signals um, in microvolts per meter at certain distances, three meters and, and um, 30 meters from the plant. And it shows, shows the leakage limits for digital signals at a three meter measurement distance and a 30 meter measurement distance. And it's all spelled out in the rules. So yes. the answer is yes, you still really have to important. make leakage measurements. It's <laughs> really important for anyone who's not that measuring. That won't go away. <laughs> Got to do this task. And well, and there's an important part in, in uh, 76.613 of the FCC rules called the harmful interference clause. And it basically says if leakage from the cable network causes harmful interference, regardless of the field strength. So it doesn't matter if it's below the FCC's limits for field strength. If the leakage causes harmful interference, you have to fix it as soon as possible. If you don't, um, the worst case scenario is the FCC can come in and, and um, force the operator to turn off the offending signals in the cable network until the leakage problem or interference problem is fixed. Um, and the cable network operator can be fined, um, in some cases substantially, um, in other cases just warned. Um, and you don't want to be in a situation where you're facing any of those things. So right. yeah, keep doing those leakage measurements. They're critical. All right. <laughs> Here's that caution. We've seen this sign uh -oh. before in other presentations. <laughs> It's an uh-oh. There is math ahead. Um, I'm going to show you several formulas and, and whatnot. We're not going to go through the how you solve them. It'll just show you the formula, and then here's the answer. But understand that, that the complexity of understanding field strength measurements does involve some number crunching. So as we continue this journey down, what is field strength? Um, here's a formula that many of you have probably used at one time or another yes. to convert um, a microvolt per meter reading from a signal leakage detector into DBMV um, that would that would be occurring um, or appearing at the terminals of the half wave dipole antenna. There's a there's another variation of this formula that goes the other direction where you can convert the the value in DBMV to microvolts per meter. But I just thought I would show this one just to emphasize that yeah, there's some math in there and some number crunching. Good news is there are some tables that have been published over the years in some of those little pocket reference guides provided by the manufacturers that show um, leakage field strength in microvolts per meter versus uh, DBMV. Um, again, where DBMV is the signal level of that leakage at the terminals of the antenna. Um, of course, that still doesn't tell us what the heck field strength is. But many of you know I'm a ham radio operator and and I find that the American Radio Relay League, the uh, I call, I'll call it the SCTE of, of the ham radio community, um, has a number of really good reference publications. And one of my favorites is the Antenna Book. The 25th edition is the most recent. I just got a copy of this um, as a Christmas present. But that book says, a measurement of the strength of a wave at a distance from the transmitting antenna is its field strength or field intensity. Say, okay, well, that seems kind of straightforward. And here's another reference that I found, and this is this is a pretty good one. Um, you'll notice it's got some formulas in it. I'm not going to go through those. But it says the strength of an electromagnetic wave can be expressed in terms of electric field strength E measured in volts per meter or magnetic field strength H measured in amperes per meter 
or of power density S measured in watts per square meter. Now, the most common, and the one we use in cable, is electric field strength, but in the far field region, they are all equivalent and related by the following two equations. So there's the, the math that, that equates all those parameters when you're in what's called the far field. We'll talk about the near field versus far field later on because it's, it's important that you measure leakage in the far field. And a couple of the terms in those formulas, Z naught is the characteristic impedance of free space or a vacuum, which is equal to 120 times pi ohms or about 377 ohms. You say, wait a minute, the free space has an impedance? Yes, it yes, does. It does. <laughs> it's like the coaxial cable has an impedance and a splitter has impedance and uh, and so on and so on. So the free space impedance is about 377 ohms. And that that value does get plugged into other equations used to characterize this thing we call field strength. And there was our, our good old friend pi again. So for those of you who watched your last presentation, Ron, we talked about pi. Pi is back. And I want to remind everyone, we are one month away from Pi Day on March 14th, 3.14, or 3.14. So that's, um, yeah, I mentioned Pi is everywhere in these equations. Pi is a really cool number. Keep an eye on Pi. You're going to see it throughout the rest, of, well, in a number of other Ron's, a number of other Ron's equations in his slides as well. Pi is such an exciting um, part of our uh part of the world and part of the math that we live in. I find it such an exciting number. Oh yeah, it's a, it's a pretty cool value. All right, here's a picture of something that I would guess that almost all of you have seen at one time or another. This is an improperly installed- Oh, that's F really improper. <laughs> on the end of a piece of coax. And you'll notice it's an old hex crimp type, which is fine. They work really, really well for their design. Um, but here it's not installed correctly or has been pulled off a little bit. But I want you to imagine this connector in this condition radiating RF, that's radio frequency, uh, radiating RF into the space around the connector. So just visualize that. Now, imagine that we put that radiating connector or leaking connector in the middle of a six meter wide balloon. Now, there's a reason. Let me get this little box out of the way. Now, that's a really big balloon, Ron. Six it meters. <laughs> but you're going to see why I chose that size here in just a little bit. Some of you probably already guessing, oh, I know why he picked that number. But so imagine this six meter wide uh, balloon surrounding our crummy F connector. And the connector is in the middle of the balloon. So that RF is radiating in all directions uniformly for this example. Um, and basically lighting up the balloon or illuminating it from the inside. So an analogy is a light bulb in the center of the balloon. Light bulb lights up the balloon from the inside. In this case, the crummy F connector is lighting up the balloon with RF from the inside, and it's lighting up the whole surface. So that's the next thing you want to imagine. This this example with the balloon is, um, is what I'm proposing here to help understand the concept of field strength a little bit more easily than just looking at a bunch of formulas. All right, now let's Take this a, a step further. After you've got this six meter wide balloon um, surrounding our leaky F connector, and I took the picture of the F connector out and put a little, little yellow asterisk in the center to represent our leak. Um, take a marker of some kind and on the surface of the balloon somewhere, draw a one meter by one meter square. Easy to do. It doesn't have to be where I show it in this balloon, it can be anywhere, um, but somewhere on the surface of the balloon. And what we're going to do is measure what's called RF power density inside of that one meter by one meter square. Now, I have a definition for power density, and that's basically the power per unit area. You say, eh, that sounds kind of complicated. We don't get into too many details on that, but just think of that as the power per unit area. Uh, power density is typically measured in watts per square meter. Um, it can also be measured in units such as milliwatts per square centimeter, but we're not going to do that. We're worried about watts per square meter. So we've got, we've got this leaky F connector in the center of our balloon. It's radiating RF uniformly in all directions. We want to measure the power um, coming from that leak, the RF power, but the power density in a one meter by one meter square that we just drew on the surface of our balloon. So we're going to call the power being leaked or transmitted by that F connector in the center of the balloon, the source power. 
and designate it PT with the subscript T, but we're going to call that PT. So there's our leaky connector at the center of the balloon. Now let's assume for this example that PT, the source power coming from that leaky connector, is really, really low. Point zero 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 one two watt or using scientific notation 1.1.2 times 10 to the minus 10th watts that's pretty low power if you think about it because you know cb wow. radio is four four watts the two-way radio in your truck is is probably 25 watts um if your cable company has a two-way radio at the office it may be anywhere from 25 to 50 watts maybe more if you use it, if your company's uh, radio system uses a repeater up on a building or tower someplace, that could be a hundred watts. Um, if the so, power is that small, why do we even care, Ron? Oh, you're going to find out. <laughs> you, <laughs> you are going to find out. Um, so let's assume that's our transmit power or source power from our leaky connector. Now, now I want to take you back to uh, some high school geometry. Now, for this, we we have to assume that our balloon is 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 spherical rather than kind of oblong shaped like this example. Um, but we'll assume that it's a, a sphere. And what we're going to do is figure out the power density inside of a one meter by one meter square that we drew on the surface of the balloon. The way we do that is to simply take the source power, PT, and divide it by the surface area of the balloon. And if you remember from high school geometry, the surface area of a sphere is four times pi, there's that pi again, we love it. times the radius squared. And r is the radius of the balloon. Since it's six meters diameter, the radius is three meters. And now you see why I picked a three meter, or sorry, a six meter wide balloon, because some of our leakage measurements are required by the FCC to be performed three meters from the plant. So that's why I picked this example. So what we want to do now is use this formula to figure out the power density inside this square on the surface of the balloon when the power leaking from our connector is 1.2 times 10 to the minus 10th watt. So I'm not going to go through the calculation, but if you plug the numbers in, um, the power density on the surface of the balloon with uh, the source power being 1.2 times 10 to the minus 10th watts uh, works out to one point, about 1 1.06 times 10 to the minus 12th watt per square meter. Now, of course, it would make sense that the power density here is going to be less than the power leaking from the connector because that power from the connector has basically spread out and it's lighting up or illuminating the entire surface of the balloon. So that power is essentially spread out all over the surface of the balloon. And we just want to know, all right, well, how much of that power is inside of that one meter by one meter square? So there right. it is, the answer right there, uh, 1.06 times 10 to the minus 12th watt per square meter. And if You've got a calculator that goes out a gazillion decimal points. There's the actual, <laughs> the actual number. Yeah, I'm notorious for doing that, and that violates the rules that our our uh, math teachers taught us back in high school. Said, Don't do that. And it's, and we also crazy. know the power re, um, reduces at, uh, as a, a one over the uh, square root, or as the distance squared, right? So the the it, it's it's basically decreases. Um, as one over r squared from your well, previous equation. Well, every time you equation. double the distance, it de decreases by 6 dB. Correct. The, uh, the field strength does. Now, there's an it depends that goes with that. That <laughs> rule only applies in the far field. It does not apply in the near field. That's why field strength measurements in the near field are bogus. But in the far field, it works just fine, yes. not in the near field. All right. More math. Um, so we talked about the, the impedance of free space being about 377 ohms. So we're going to use a formula that if you look at it closely, you say, hey, wait a minute, that looks kind of like some of the formulas that are derived from Ohm's law. E for voltage, P for power, Z for would be the equivalent, the equivalent in the world of Ohm's law would be R for resistance. resistance. But here we're looking at voltage E on the surface of the balloon in volts per meter is equal to the power density inside that square times the impedance of free space, 377 ohms. And then we take the square root of all that. So there it is. We plug that 1.06 times 10 to the minus 12th watt in there, mm -hmm. multiply it by the impedance of space, which is 120 times pi, take the square root of that, and we get a number that looks awfully familiar, 
zero 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 two zero volt per meter or 20 microvolts per meter wow that's actually a large number i mean it's well it is um the fcc says thou shalt not exceed this for free analog signals in the roughly 54 megahertz to 260 16 megahertz range at a measurement distance of three meters so that's why i use this particular example right but keep in mind the source power 1.2 times 10 to the minus 10th watt produces um, assuming the rf is radiating uniformly in all directions which it won't in the real world but assuming it does it gives us a power density of this 1.06 times 10 to the minus 12th watt per square meter which works out to a field strength of 20 microvolts per meter yeah i mean i might not, i won't put this on the top of my leakage uh, repair list but that's still when we looked at all of those zeros in front of the decimal point, I thought, well, that's not a very big number. But when you do the math, 20 microvolts, that starts to become a leak that we have Remember to keep an eye on. Remember, it's 20 microvolts per meter, not microvolts. <laughs> got to gotta do that. And <laughs> I know that's a bad habit that people say, ah, the leak's 20 microvolts. No, it's not. It's 20 microvolts yes, per yes. meter. Yes, it, yes. It, it's easy. It's easy to start shortening things. But to your point, we got to make like, sure we keep the units in there. It's like measuring signal level in dB rather yeah, than Yeah, just, uh, just it's 20 dB. No, it's no, 20 it's dB microvolts. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's let's continue on here. Now, as we start to look at this thing a little bit more closely, um, things can get a little confusing when we're measuring leakage on more than one frequency. And these days, I'd say most cable operators are using leakage detectors that can measure leakage on multiple frequencies, sometimes just two, sometimes three, sometimes more. Um, and typically... Um, operators are looking for leakage down in the aeronautical band, that VHF aeronautical band. So let's call it around 130 megahertz or so. Um, and they're also usually looking for leakage up in the 600 to 800 megahertz range. And, and a common frequency uh, for the higher, the, uh, in the higher band is 612 megahertz. A lot of leakage detectors support that. So we're measuring typically on more than one frequency. Let's go through an example where we have a leak, a loose connector, a cracked shield or something that's creating a field strength of 20 microvolts per meter at two frequencies. And we're gonna measure those with two different antennas because we obviously want a half wave dipole that is resonant at the lower frequency and another half wave dipole that's resonant at the higher frequency. And by what, what you mean by resonant, does that mean it's, it's able to receive those signals at the low frequency and the high frequency? What, what, what is the, well, what do you mean by them, resonant? Both of them will, will receive signals at those frequencies. But what you want is an antenna that, that, that I, I like to use the analogy of a tuning fork. Um, so you, you tap a tuning fork and it, it uh, emits a certain tone. And we could say that that tuning fork is resonant at whatever that tone, is, the frequency of that tone is when you tap it. So the antenna is kind of the same way. It is resonant at a certain frequency and is going to give you the best performance at that frequency. Now, there's a whole bunch of other math and other fun things that get involved in, in defining what a half-wave dipole antenna looks like. And then you start looking at things like current uh, distribution, and voltage distribution, and, and other fun stuff, which might be a topic for another day. Yeah. Um, so the, so the antenna has been tuned and optimized to receive yeah. at a given frequency. That's right. And, or transmit it at a given frequency. Yes. That's right. So just use the analogy of a tuning fork. We tap that tuning fork, it, it gives us a tone of a certain frequency. If we were to use that analogy and say we're going to tap our dipole, now this doesn't really happen, but you tap the dipole and it's going to um, emit a tone at, say, 121 megahertz or something Perfect. like that. That so makes sense, Ron. It's, nice. it's a, that's an analogy. Not a real good one, but <laughs> it's an analogy. Now, here's where the confusion comes into play. Let's say we've got leakage. We're measuring on a low frequency and we're measuring on a high frequency. And we find our leakage detector, which can measure at those frequencies. Um, we're using two different antennas. We, we measure 20 microvolts per meter field strength on both frequencies. Yet, if we use that formula that I showed earlier and we convert to DBMV values um, at, the, at the terminals of the antenna, the DBMV values will be different for the same power density and the same field strength. And say, Ew, what the heck is going on here? So here's an example. Let's say we've got a field strength of 20 microvolts per meter at 121.2625 megahertz. That's going to produce minus 42.1 dBmV at the terminals of a resonant half-wave dipole for that frequency. And then if we make a field strength measurement with a resonant half-wave dipole 
for 782 megahertz. We come up with 20 microvolts per meter field strength. The dBmV value at the dipole antenna terminals will be minus 58.29 dBmV. Look at the huh. difference. Why is the field that? strength's the same, but the <laughs> value of the two dBmV numbers is different. Yet we're using resonant half-wave dipoles. Each dipole has the same gain. So why are they so the different? gain is not, the gain hasn't changed. The dipole's gain in free space is is one point six four. That's a linear number. If you convert that to decibels, uh, ten times the logarithm of one point six four, you get two point one five dB of gain. Say so what is going on here? Why do we get different dBmV numbers? Now we said the free the field strength's the same, power density is the same, but the dBmV values are different. What on earth is going on here? It's a real head scratcher, Ron. It is. So let's go through. <laughs> um, let's go through a discussion about this, and we're going to use the assumptions that I've put together in this table. We'll use these two measurement frequencies: so 121.2625 megahertz and 780, 782 megahertz. So okay, we're going to assume the antennas for the two frequencies are lossless resonant half-wave dipoles. I say lossless because. Dipole antennas are made out of metal of some kind, and that has resistance, and that means they're going to be lossy. Not a lot, but they're going to be a little bit lossy. So some of the power received by the antenna in a real antenna is going to be dissipated as heat by the, the loss in the, in the metal. But we're going to assume for this example, just to keep it simple, Perfect that world. it's lost. <laughs> um, well, and the actual loss isn't going to be, it's not going to change it a whole lot, but we'll just, we'll just keep it simple. We're going to say that the field strength at the point where we make the measurements, 20 microvolts per meter at both frequencies. Yes. We're going to assume that the measurement distance for both frequencies is three meters, so pretty straightforward. And the important point here, it's in the far field region for both of those frequencies. We're going to assume that each antenna, each dipole antenna, is terminated by a load, a spectrum analyzer, a leak detector, whatever, and the, the coax connected to it equal to its radiation resistance. Now, for a half-wave dipole, radiation resistance is approximately 73 ohms. Um, we use 75 ohm impedance coax in test equipment, so that's, that's pretty close. That's a negligible impedance mismatch. We're going to assume each dipole is oriented. We adjust, you know, adjust its position to get the maximum received signal level. Um, we're going to assume that each antenna does not re-radiate any of the intercepted signal. Real-world antennas do. You're going to pick up some RF, and some of it's going to be re-radiated. Not necessarily a whole lot, but some of it's re-radiated. I'll touch on that in a minute. Um, and then we're going to assume that the polarization of the leak is linear. So either vertically polarized or horizontally polarized, but not something like circularly polarized. And we're going to assume um, that that linear polarization is the same as the polarity of the antenna or the orientation of the antenna. So for this example, we'll just assume we're going to hold the antennas horizontal. For horizontal polarity, we'll assume the polarity of the leak is also horizontal. So those are all of our assumptions. So to figure out what the heck's going on here, we're going to start by going back to our balloon, our six meter uh, diameter balloon. And remember where we drew that box on the balloon? Yep. We're going to take our we're going to take our dipole antennas one at a time, place them on the one meter by one meter square, and then the field strength that's inside of that square is going to be measured. Okay. So the question now is, how much of the power inside of the square is intercepted by each antenna? And this is going to help us understand why one antenna received more power than the other antenna. Uh, or or yes. at different frequencies. I'm sorry, not, not, yes. <laughs> not different antennas. <laughs> yes. So they, and you know, the power, and it's the power that's intercepted by each antenna and delivered to the load. So is right. it going to be all of the power that's inside that square? Is it going to be an amount that's occupying an area that's equal to the physical dimensions of the antenna or something else? So let's find out. So I couldn't create a very good graphic here, but um, so I, so pardon, pardon the uh, kind of the simplicity of this graphic, but visualize what happens when you place a dipole antenna on the surface of the balloon. An RF is radiating from that leaky connector in the middle of the balloon that's three meters away, and it's zipping by our antenna at the speed of light. That RF field induces a voltage that we'll call V 
in the dipole, remember it's, a, it's an antenna and it's resonant, that, that results in a current that we'll call I through the approximately 73 ohms impedance at the antenna terminals. So far, so good. Now, what we're interested in is the power, P, delivered by the antenna to that impedance. Where, and we're going to, here's another formula, where P, power, equals the current squared times RT, where RT is the sum of the antenna's radiation resistance, about 73 ohms, and loss resistance, which we're assuming to be zero because we said lossless antenna. So we would technically have to add the, figure out the loss in the antenna and um, plug that number in. But we're going to assume it to be zero for this example. Again, we're back to like Ohm's law again here with power. Yeah, yeah Ohm's <laughs> it's law so is so simple. <laughs> Well, and you, you think about it, and some of the formulas that are used here are pretty straightforward. Yeah. Say, oh, wait, I remember a variation of that formula from Ohm's Law. Now, let's let's talk about something called antenna aperture. Um, if we can think of a dipole antenna, or actually any antenna for that matter, as an aperture that has a, a certain area that extracts power from a passing electromagnetic wave, and then delivers it to the load that's connected to the to the terminals, which would be right here. So we've got this piece of coax that goes to a leak detector or whatever. The tricky part is defining aperture. And it's not as simple as you might think. Because you think, well, aperture, that's that's equal to the physical dimension of the antenna, right? The, the length of it times the, well, let's call it the width of those elements. That's the aperture, right? Well, not really. Hmm. For those of you who like to get into the really nerdy stuff or the geeky stuff. This is one of my favorite references on antennas written by John Krause. Uh, he's, he's passed away now, but this is a great book. This is a picture of the second edition. There's a, there's a third edition now, which I think was a co-author contributed to either around the time Krause passed away or maybe after, I, I don't remember. But in the book Antennas, Krause um, says the following, and, and he, he basically says there are three types of aperture. This is antenna aperture that describe ways in which power collected by the antenna may be divided. It's into the power in the terminal resistance. Remember, that's the impedance that connected to the antenna terminals. So that's called the effective aperture. Into heat in the antenna, that's the loss aperture. Remember, for our example, we're assuming it's a lossless antenna. No so resistance in it. Yeah. And then into re-radiated power, that's called scattering aperture. So those are three different types of aperture right there that really have very little to do with the physical dimensions of that antenna. Now, there's a fourth aperture called collecting aperture, which is the sum of the previous three that I just mentioned. And then there's a fifth one called physical aperture. And there's where we get into that physical size of the antenna. That's basically the, the length times the, the height of the element. So we've come up with this area for aperture. But <laughs> the surprising thing is... That physical aperture really doesn't have a whole lot to do with, deter with with how much power is actually intercepted by the antenna. And that's what surprises a lot of people. Say, oh, all right, so what the heck does that? All right, so we're assuming, for our example, remember, that our antennas, our dipoles, are lossless. So that means that the effective aperture, or more specifically, since we're assuming this lossless condition, the, the maximum effective aperture, A subscript EM, um, is the criteria that can be used to describe how much of the RF power inside that one meter by one meter box on our balloon is intercepted and delivered to the load connected to the antenna's terminals. And there's the formula for it. And it is the wavelength squared divided by four pi, there's pi again, times g, where g is the numerical gain of the antenna. So wavelength, this is the lambda right here, uh, in meters is 299.792458 divided by <clears throat> frequency in megahertz. So that's an easy one to figure out. G is a numerical gain, and that's 1.64 for a half-wave dipole. Remember, this is not the decibel gain. This is the numerical gain. They're different. But the the in in that previous slide, the wavelength squared, that's has a very heavy weight on the oh, formula. Yeah, big time. Well, and you'll see all these do. If you have a real high-gain antenna, G that's going to have an impact to yeah. it as well. Four pi, that's going to be the same that's, no matter what. Yeah. But yeah, wavelength plays a big role in that, and G plays a big role in that. So Absolutely. we're using a dipole, so 
we're stuck with 1.64 for G and wavelength. We just plug in what, you know, whatever our formula is and or whatever our, the frequency is that we're using. And we come up with the wavelength and you see that hmm, there might be some relationship here. So the a linear half wave dipole, that's this critter represented here by this dark black line, half wavelength dipole antenna. Its maximum effective aperture is an elliptically shaped aperture. I drew this ellipse around here and I, it's not scaled exact, but it's close just to illustrate the concept that has an area equal to 0.13 wavelength squared as shown in the graphic. So what that says is the effective or maximum effective aperture of this dipole antenna is this ellipse. So the area of the ellipse defines the percentage of power intercepted by the antenna and delivered to the antenna's terminals. Okay, more math. <laughs> Wait, we have a, we have a, a comment, uh, a couple comments. So first of all, uh, throwaway account, yo yo, hi, good to see you. Thanks for joining us. And Jeremiah says, fitting that visible car FM antennas are based on the wavelength for 88 to 108 megahertz. I used a reference. I used to reference this when asked why multi frequency leakage detectors have different antennas. So thanks, Jeremiah. Thanks for uh, throwing that in there. But that's uh, Basically, uh, you know, we see car radio f antennas are a little bit longer than what we see maybe on a cell phone antenna, but you use different antennas for different frequencies. Yes, you can. And sometimes you can use the same antenna for different frequencies, but it may not work as well as at one frequency versus another one. Right. Um, all right. So the free space wavelength for 121 megahertz, which is our low frequency in this example, is about two and a half meters, 2.47 meters. I'm doing everything in meters because we're talking microvolts per meter and stuff. Yes. You could convert that to yards or inches or whatever you want, but roughly two and a half meters. And for our higher frequency, 782 megahertz, um, the free space wavelength is about 0.38 meters. So just under four tenths of a meter. So that you plug those numbers into that formula on the earlier slide, that gives us a maximum effective aperture of point just under 0 0.8, but 0.79766683, so on, meters squared for the 121 megahertz dipole. And the effective aperture, or maximum effective aperture for 782 megahertz is 0 0.019 meters squared. So already you can see the effective aperture is quite a bit different for the two different dipoles. Even though the dipoles have the same gain, the field strength is the same, the effective aperture is different for those um, those two antennas and they denote the the aem values denote the percentage of power that's in that one meter by one meter box we drew on the balloon is actually intercepted by each antenna and then delivered to the load connected to the terminals and the difference between the two aem values um, can be figured out but with this formula so you've got the effective aperture um, maximum effective aperture for one dipole, divide it by the other one, take the logarithm of that ratio, multiply by 10, and you get 16.19 dB. So there's a roughly 16 dB difference between the effective apertures. That happens to be equal to the antenna factor difference between the two dipoles. Now there's a term most of you probably have not heard. Um, if you work for a manufacturer or have, have been involved in the world of of uh, RF interference measurements and stuff, you're probably, you probably have heard of the term antenna factor. Uh, so let's take a quick detour and see what the heck that is. Um, the antenna factor is the ratio of the field strength of an electromagnetic field. So think of the leakage coming from a loose connector incident upon an antenna to the voltage produced by that field across a load impedance that's connected to the antenna's terminals. That's the antenna factor. And it's, um, if you want to learn more, I did write an article about that back in 2012. There's a link to the article. Nice, thank you. It's on SCTE's website. You can you could go to their archives of my old CT article, communications technology articles and find it. But the antenna factors for the two dipoles in this example are 8.12 dB slash M, that's dB meter. Um, and 24.31 dB meter respectively. So that's for the low frequency and the high frequency. And you can learn more about antenna factor that are in that article that I wrote. So, so is it safe to say that the effective aperture 
goes up as wavelength goes up, and that improves the ability of the antenna to receive the the signal. Is that is that a is that kind of a summary of it, Ron, or am I stating that incorrectly? Well, you said as the wavelength goes up, so as the wavelength increases. Oh, no, as the frequency goes up and the wavelength so would go the down. So as the frequency decreases. Yes. And it's actually the way you said it the first time. Okay. Yeah. But take a look here. The antenna factor is lower at the lower frequency than it is at the higher frequency, but the effective aperture is less at the higher frequency than it is at the lower frequency. And I've got a graphic that's going to illustrate that here, right here. So what that means is, if we're measuring leakage on two frequencies, and we've got an identical field strength of 20 microvolts per meter, and of course we know that the dBmV values at our antenna terminals are different, um, the lower frequency antenna delivers or intercepts and delivers more power to its load, and that's represented by this large ellipse here with our low frequency antenna, and it's about 8.5 times 10 to the minus 13th watt than the higher frequency antenna does. That's about a little over 2 times 10 to the minus 14th watt. So that's a smaller number. Here, too, the dB difference between these two is the same as the antenna factor difference. It's a little over 16 dB. So right. this large ellipse here on the left represents the maximum effective aperture for our 121 megahertz half-wave dipole. The small ellipse represents the maximum effective aperture for the 782 megahertz dipole. Remember, the dip each dipole antenna has the same gain, about 2.15 dB or 1.64 for in terms of numerical numbers. Our power density is the same. Um, we've got the same field strength, yet we have different dBmV values. And here's why. So, okay, and just and just one quick question here. So, like a field strength meter, as you mentioned, four has the ability to receive um, two different frequencies, 121 and the, and the higher frequency. So it's going to yeah. have two different antennas in it. In it the, the probably, and I've got as an you example. just showed in, in that in that slide. With yes, okay. Or it's going to have one antenna design, and the fact the manufacturer has has calculated and measured the antenna factor for each of those frequencies for right. that one antenna, and then they can use that to produce calibrated field strength values. But it's not unusual to see different antennas, one for lower frequency, one for higher frequency. That's frankly a better way to do it, I think. Correct. Okay. Now, all this jibes with the two different signal levels at the dipole's terminals. Remember, we had um, for that field strength of 40, or sorry, 20 microvolts per meter, a resonant half-wave dipole at 121 megahertz gives us a dBmV value at the antenna terminals of minus 42, about minus 42 dBmV. And for the, the higher frequency dipole antenna, and a 20 microvolt per meter field strength, the dBmV values minus 58.29 dBmV. Um, again, that's for identical 20 microvolt per meter field strengths. The difference between this number, the minus 42.1 and the minus 58.29, is also equal to the antenna factor difference of a little over 16 dB. See right. how this is related? Now, there's the one meter by one meter box. I figured I better put that on here. So <laughs> what we can, what it shows, and I tried to scale these. They're they're close. They may not be exact, but I tried to scale these so that what you see is the effective aperture of our low frequency dipole um, has an area equivalent to this ellipse. It's bigger than the and box. You can see, well, actually, it's smaller than the box. It's about eighty percent of the area of the one meter by one meter box. Now it's longer, it's sticking out the side, but up here it's less. And if you chopped off this area on the end of each end of the ellipse and stuck it inside here, you'd still have um, space left over. Yeah. So that that works out to be, this ellipse works out to be, it's about 0.79% or sorry, about 79% about of the area of the box. So that says that this, this half wave dipole at the higher, the lower frequency is intercepting a little less than 80% of the power inside of the one meter by one meter box. And down here or, or over here on the right, you can see that the ellipse of our uh, representing the, the maximum effective aperture of the higher frequency antenna is a whole lot smaller than the lower frequency one, even though the two antennas have the same gain. So here you can see that the, the high frequency antenna is intercepting a lot less power 
or a much smaller percentage of the power inside that one meter by one meter box. Right. That is why for, for an identical field strength in microvolts per meter, you get different DBMV readings um, at the terminals of your dipole antennas. That's, I mean, that's what it boils down to right there. So this is a, a final point that I want to emphasize. When you measure leakage, be sure to do it in the sources far field region. And I've got another graphic that shows the near field and far field region. Uh, good friend of, of ours, uh, you know him very well, uh, as do I. Arnie Lundale was kind enough to provide these examples. So, Shout out to they, Arnie. <laughs> yes. In the first picture, there's a leak coming, actually leakage across frequency, a wide range of frequencies, coming from this pedestal over here. Now, the he's about three meters away from the pedestal where the leak is. And you'll notice his leak detector has two antennas. Uh, the left antenna is for the high frequency, the right antenna is for the low frequency. And it's kind of hard to see with the reflection, but in this case, the leakage field strength three meters away from the pedestal is the same on the two frequencies. 756 megahertz on the left is 180 microvolts per meter, and at 126 megahertz, it's also 180 microvolts per meter. So you can see they're, they're the same field strength. That happens to be a coincidence in this case, but they're the same field strength three meters away. And it's just the camera, it's the, the camera lens that kind of distorts this perspective. It makes it look like yeah. that pedestal is a lot farther away than it is, but it's really about three meters away. The next picture on the right, he repeated the, the leakage measurement, um, but he's less than a meter from the pedestal. And in this case, you'll see at the high frequency, at 756 megahertz, the field strength on the detector, 450 microvolts per meter. Um, but the, the one on the right for the lower frequency um, says 2100 microvolts per meter. The field strength reading on the right is bogus. And why is it bogus? It's because for that frequency, the detector is now in the near field region for that frequency. The detector is still outside of the near field region and is still in the far field region for the higher frequency. So the leakage field strength for the higher frequency is a legitimate value. But when you start popping your detector next to a loose connector or something. Say, oh, I got 5,000 microvolts per meter. Well, you don't know what you've got because you're in the near field region. And that is a bogus number on your leakage detector. You can't use that as a legitimate, valid field strength. Yeah, it's high, but you don't know what it really is because we're, you got to be in that near field or you got to be in that far field region. Now, let me skip past the Q and A slide here. Just uh, and I before, just this is an extra. Yeah, because I ahead. think we have to talk about the near field and far field. Um, just before we do that, let's answer yeah. Jeremiah's question. He says uh, one thirty eight and six twelve megahertz is what we have used for years. Is there something in the math that relates these frequencies to field strength measurements and or antenna factor? Um, well, just like with all the. The, ex or the examples that I went through before, you could calculate the antenna factor for those two frequencies. Uh, and it's, we're assuming that the dipole antennas have a um, radiation resistance of 73 ohms, and that's their impedance. And at the impedance of the connected to the terminals is se roughly 73, maybe 75 ohms. Um, you can calculate the antenna factor difference. The manufacturer of the leak detector does that anyway for you. So you don't have to do any corrections. As long as you make the leakage de detection measurements in the far field, which is typically why the FCC says at least three meters away, but depending on the frequency, it may be something else. It might be 30 meters, but most operators do three meters. Um, you get much closer than that. And in the low frequency range, like 138 megahertz, you're going to get bogus numbers because you get into the near field. Um, the high frequency, you got to get real, real close to get into the near field, but it, it's still important. The reason for 138 and 612 um, in a lot of leak detectors is 138 megahertz falls on a CTA channel boundary. Um, what is it between 16 and channel 16 and 17 or 17, 18? I forget which. Um, so it's right on the, the channel boundary and the leakage signal source that's used in the head ender hub um, generates a special test signal that goes in between adjacent SC QAM channels, so right on the channel boundary between two adjacent signals. And it's low level, typically about 30 dB down. The leakage detector detects that test signal, and then it adds back a correction factor of, let's say, 30 dB to get an equivalent field strength 
that is that as if you measured the leaking qualm haystack itself. And the other frequency, 612, was chosen because that is in a UHF TV channel slot that is not used for over-the-air broadcasting. Um, that particular channel slot where 612, 612 megahertz is, is actually allocated to radio astronomy. So ideally, if you find leakage there, it's coming from the cable network most likely. I mean, it could be coming from something else, but there shouldn't be any intentional over-the-air signals in that frequency range around 612 megahertz because that's that's allocated for radio astronomy purposes. But yes, you can apply all the principles we just discussed about antenna aperture, um, antenna factor and all that, and, and you can do the number crunching and, and you'll come up with numbers specific to those two frequencies. Thanks, perfect. Thanks for the question, Jeremiah and everyone. Good one. Um, yeah, good please question. hit that uh, like bell if you liked Ron's explanation and subscribe if you haven't and hit that notification bell when we come live I again. Do. And while we're here, I figured it'd probably be a good idea to show what the heck this near field, far field thing is. I think um, it's really important because I also, I'm going to ask you another question after you explain this uh, so you can let everyone in the audience know about it because I was really surprised about the explanation you gave me in the pre-show, Ron. Um, well, and, and here we are. This, so here's a definition. It's the region, the far field is a region of an antenna's radiation pattern in which the angular distribution of radiated energy is largely independent <coughs> excuse me, of distance from the antenna and in which the power varies inversely with the square of the distance. This is the part you were talking about, Brady, is the power varying inversely with the square of the distance. Yeah. That relationship does not apply in the near field. That's important to understand. So the approximate distance from the antenna, and I've got that circled in green here, so it's, the assumption is it's a half-wave dipole, the acceptable, and this approximate distance to the beginning of the far field, and that would be the outside of this light blue circle here, is generally accepted to be R equals uh, 2D squared divided by wavelength, where R is the distance from the antenna, so we got that number there, and D is the largest dimension of the antenna, so for a dipole, that's the end-to-end -end length. If you get into Yagi's and log periodic antennas and stuff, that, that gets a little wonky, but for illustration purposes, the dipole makes it easier. And D is the largest dimension and then lambda is wavelength. So you plug those numbers in and you can get the approximate distance um, to the near field, far field boundary. You wanna be making leakage measurements if, if you want accurate measurements in the far field. So lower frequency um, means that that far field is going to start farther away from the antenna than, than uh, at a higher frequency. That's why in the example um, of the slides that Arnie provided us, we got within a meter, or actually a little less than a meter from the leaky pedestal um, or whatever's inside the pedestal that was leaking. Um, the higher frequency field strength measurement was still in the far field for that higher frequency, but um, the leak detector was way, was, was inside the near field for the low frequency. So the field strength was bogus. So there we go. Nice. Nice description. Near field and far field was also something that um, uh, is really important in that I spent a lot of time with when in, when I was doing studies uh, in understanding like just electromagnetic radiation and how it propagates. We did a lot of modeling, but um, I know like in your equations, anytime you're doing anything with the near field, the equations kind of blow up. You everything has to be done studying in the far field, kind of far away from the antenna. Yeah, yeah. You don't want to be right close to it because things are things get really weird. Yes, uh, but one thing. Um, when we were talking before the show started, Ron, and I and I was asking about like radial cracks in cable and how signals can uh, leak out of those or leak into those, you really opened my eyes to something that I had not considered before. Because I was saying, well, you know, the size of the crack can impact how those signals leak in and leak out. And I really think this applies to a near field impact on, on that and, and, and other things as well. But if you could enlighten us, Ron, and, and kind of just recommunicate what you described to me about how uh, grounding cables and things like that impact uh, something like a radio crack. And it's it's kind of not just the width of that radio crack and, and stuff like that that impacts the antenna, but it's all the near field things and all the all the grounding and things like that. Well, that impacts it's more than just so complex. Field. It's more than just near field. It's far, near field effects, far field effects, reflections from the ground, yeah. reflections from nearby objects, coupling to parallel conductors. Um, when uh, a signal leak occurs, 
we have a, let's say a crack in the cable. That crack in the cable becomes equivalent to the feed point of an antenna, like the a feed point of a dipole antenna, except the the uh, the antenna in this case behaves more like a long wire antenna than it does a resonant dipole because we've got some some length of strand and some length of of cable and the outside surface because of skin effect which we've talked about previously yes of the strand and the coax act like an antenna and act like a long wire antenna so if you feed a um a long wire antenna at the center and then if you if you plug that into a um an antenna modeling uh, software program you'll find that that you don't get the nice radiation pattern of a dipole. You get all these weird lobes and other things all over the place. And they, of course, vary with frequency. And, and then you start putting parallel conductors in the, into the equation. And now you've got the telephone strand uh, a foot below the cable TV strand. And uh, they're bonded at the pole to comply with National Electrical Safety Code requirements. And you've got the neutral conductor, typically about four feet or so above the cable TV strand. And maybe those dimensions may vary a little bit. Uh, but the neutral conductor is also bonded to that vertical ground wire on each pole um, for safety. And unfortunately, it also means that some of the RF current is going to be coupled to both of those conductors uh, directly via the bonds. And it's going to be coupled by induction uh, because of the proximity of, of the uh, radiating coax and, and uh, strand and the proximity to those, those two. So it'll be like um, the RF energy that's coupled up to different elements in say a Yagi antenna from the driven element to the reflector and the, and the or sorry, from the, yeah, the, 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 the driven elements and uh, directors and, and the reflector. So it gets in, it gets real complicated. Then you've got the ground below it. You've got the vertical riser down there. You've got houses and buildings and, and other things. And now the, the radiation pattern gets really, really weird. And what happens is you get this RF inside the cable that's coming out through this crack. It is coupled to the outer surface of the shield and strand it becomes what can be called a common mode current. And when you have current flowing because of Maxwell's equations, you have radiation. Yes. And I don't mean radiation like radioactivity, but electromagnetic, electromagnetic radiation. radiation. It's, it's an antenna. It's radiating RF into the space around it. And, and that's because that current is flowing there. So that's, and that's going on and it's, it's, uh, it's creating all kinds of weird things and because of all these weird lobes, both looking at it actually a-X-I-A-L-Y, axially, and longitudinally, we've got all these weird lobes and stuff. And you may find the field strength above the leak is less than it is at the ground or vice versa. It's not going to be radiating uniformly. It's got all these weird lobes to it. So when we measure leakage in our cable networks, we've got to make sure that we're doing a good job of, of accurately measuring the field strength, doing the repair, and getting rid of the leakage to the extent that we can. Because if we've got a bunch of RF leaking up into the the uh, the higher atmosphere that says uh, say that on the, at least an aeronautical band that could interfere with aircraft navigation and communications the leakage going off to the side or whatever can leak can interfere with two-way radio communications broadcast TV and you know ham radio and, and the list goes on basically the leakage can interfere with license over the air services and if it's harmful interference not a good thing no G great explanation though on uh, how all the impacts and everything it goes into this is far more complex than what you think that you know what a oh, yeah. simple radio crack can do. Um, we do have a, a question from E. Brown. Um, how often does leakage in the field occur, and does the environment exasperate leakage potential? For example, living in Southern California, earthquakes are common. Sorry to hear that. <laughs> um, what we know is true, or extreme weather. So, um, Ron. How how well do, do leaks occur <laughs> in the real world? <laughs> let's just let's just say signal leakage is job security. <laughs> uh, and, and say, all right, well, what causes leakage to occur in the first place? And leakage occurs when the shielding integrity of the coaxial cable part of the network is degraded for some reason. Um, a crack in the cable, a loose connector, a squirrel chew in the shield. And that that happens to telephone cables and other stuff. Squirrels will will chew up the cables and cause damage. But of course, when they chew the shield on our coax, it not only lets water get in and, and cause problems, but the the uh, the chew also degrades the shielding integrity of the cables, and that can cause signals to leak out. Um, customers moving things around in their house, they rearrange the furniture, and they disconnect the cable from the set-top box and move things around and then reconnect the cable, and they don't properly tighten it, not knowing that, hey, it's important that that connector be tight. Um, improperly installed connectors. There's a big list of things that can cause 
the shielding integrity to be affected. So I won't say signal leakage occurs all the time, but I think you'd be hard pressed to find a cable system where leakage is not happening to some extent. That's why the FCC has rules in place that tell cable operators, you must monitor substantially um, 100% of the plant once a quarter. Uh, as, and you can do it by having leak detectors in your vehicles and you're driving around and doing routine stuff. And the leakage detector technology these days actually uses GPS and stuff. Yeah. You can tag you know, text driving around. It actually tags it. It says, yeah. all right, I found a leak, this field strength at this this latitude and longitude. And you take all that stuff back and dump it into a into a tool and it puts it on a map and then the text can go out and find it and find it and fix it. Um, but it's, I mean, we could fix every leak in a cable system today. And, and as soon back. as the world use that cable tomorrow, <laughs> there's going to be a new leak. So it's job security. So it's always there. Now, the environmental factors, um, if you, let's say you've got a, a loose connector or radial crack. Over temperature, the dimensions of the crack will change as the cable contracts and expands. So that can affect the leakage. When the wind blows, um, it can affect the intensity of the leakage coming from a crack cable, for example. Earthquake. Well, who knows? Maybe, I don't think. Yeah, that's a who knows. I don't I think if the plant didn't have any leakage and you, things are jiggling around, it's probably not going to be a big deal. But if you've got a loose connector or something and it's jiggling around because of an earthquake, yeah, yeah that's going to change the leakage. But that'd be like the wind blowing. Um, so we've got the temperature ch- exchange uh, or temperature changes in extremes, um, rain. All those things can can affect leakage field strength. But the main thing is if the shielding integrity of the coax is degraded, then leakage can occur. So signals can leak out and then over the air signals can leak in and we get ingress. So that's why the industry has to has to pay a lot of attention to this. And it's a it's pretty important to the industry because these days with digital signals and two way cable networks, the cable operators have done an incredible job of keeping leakage under control compared to, say, 30 years ago when it wasn't that big a deal. But yes, these days it's a real big deal. Ron, I, I know we're, we're a little over time. Let's, we've got one more. We'll get, see if we can get time for one more question. Um, Grab a sandwich says, uh, do open neutrals affect anything else in the plant other than medi- melting the coax? I've seen it a few times. Well, that's a biggie, particularly at the customer premises. I know it's not related to signal leakage, but if the neutral is loose or faulty in the in the electrical panel at the subscriber premises, or it gets disconnected for some reason or out at the pole, the neutral conductor path going back to the um, to the pole now goes via the subscriber drop shield, yes. and that it, it's not unusual to see um, neutral current of several amperes uh, when you get into the the strand of the coax because that supports the coax because we're bonded to the telephone company and the power company neutral it's not unusual to see several tens of amperes of, of sheath current that that's a that's normal behavior and that's why we have all this bonding is to minimize that but if you get that open neutral at the customer premises the the neutral current um now pr- takes the subscriber drop to be its neutral conductor and yeah if it's enough it'll melt the cable <laughs> and do all kinds of nasty things. I don't think you're going to see an issue with respect to leakage and ingress, though, because it's real hard to ground RF. That's okay. a that's a topic for another day. Well, one less thing we have to worry about then. Um, well, so. yeah, it's, I'd say the electrical <laughs> electrical issues and the safety issues for broken neutral Getting are far shot. more Be careful, of a concern than, than they have to do with leakage and ingress. Yeah. All right. Well, folks, we we got to wrap this up. We've uh, gone more than an hour now. This is one of our longer shows. And Ron, this was a great topic, a lot of math in here. This was one of more of our technical shows. So thank you so much. Thanks. Everyone, please like, subscribe, hit the notification bell. We appreciate when you do that. Thanks, everyone, for your questions in the chat. If you have more questions, please drop them uh, in our YouTube channel and listen to our audio as well. I'd like to Give a big thanks to Ron for the great information he shared. And we really, Ron, we really appreciate your technical expertise on this. Um, Discussions like these really help us and help our industry and really help us kind of move forward technically and understand everything that's going on and dispel the myths that we have, even the ones that I have, because, you know, I think I understand things. And Ron, I appreciate so much when you correct me on the things that I don't understand. (laughs) Um, We... We will be back on February 23rd with John Downey for our next next installment of Get Your Tech On, our show on Doxis. So um, thank you again, Ron. Thank you for everyone who watched live and uh, talked in our chat. And thanks, everyone, who watched. So take care, everyone. See you all. Goodbye. So long. <laughs>